My name is Matt O'Keefe. I'm the editor of the Irish Farmers Monthly, and it's my privilege to host and uh, facilitate uh, this evening's event, the second of a two-parter, the first part of uh, Chagas's annual uh, beef conference or virtual webinar now because of unforeseen circumstances uh, being held this evening, Wednesday. If you tuned in on Monday evening, you would have heard uh, Chris Daly major on CBV, the Commercial Beef Value Index, which uh, will, I think, prove to be a, a, an immensely beneficial um, piece of technology for, for store producers, for wheeling producers, and uh, for uh, calf buyers and, and, uh, as well. On this evening's uh, seminar, we're going to major, first of all, on a presentation from Dr. Paul Crossan, the Chegisk Beef uh, Enterprise Leader uh, based at Grange, and he's going to talk about all about the implications of slaughter age on GHG grass, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, further on, we'll be joined by Dr. Kevin Hanrahan and uh, Professor Frank O'Mara, the recently or relatively recently appointed director of Chagask. And we will, of course, facilitate Q&A right through the evening. There's a, a facility at the bottom of your screen where you can type in a question and uh, we'll get through as many of them as possible. That's what the evening essentially is about. Uh, it's, it's, it's to service the requirements of, of cattle farmers right around the country and delighted so many of you could join us this evening. Um, we will intersperse the evening's events with a couple of very short videos, just uh, one on, on new technologies in particular that are, that are breaking through and we'll hear the commentary on how far those are from being actually available commercially on farms and, and the implications of them. But first of all, I want to introduce and uh, put across to uh, Dr. Paul Crossan, uh, his paper on uh, the implications of slaughter age on GHG emissions. Paul, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, good evening, everyone. So um, in this presentation, what I want to present here are, I suppose, some of the implications of slaughter age for beef cattle uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. And you'll have heard quite a bit about this, I suppose, in recent times, both in the media and in, in public policy. And I suppose the two key messages that I want to put across here and that I hope you'll be able to take home is that, yes, it is an effective option. Uh, and, you know, also in, in terms of presenting that to give some magnitude of the, uh, of the effect of this practice. But secondly, I want to also look at some of the, I suppose, considerations that we need to take on board uh, in terms of how we actually achieve a, re a reduced age at slaughter. Um, just in terms of starting off and looking at where we are at the moment, uh, if we look at international benchmarks uh, for, for slaughter age, um, if we look at the, I suppose, the FAO statistics on slaughter age, uh, we would fall within the Western European category. So we have one of the lowest um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of beef, uh, of beef systems globally. Uh, bringing that down to a European context, we're also one of the best uh, within a European context. So, you know, we have a very positive story to tell on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and in particular on emissions intensity. So the amount of emissions that we produce uh, per kilo of beef. And that's an important message that we always need to bear in mind. Of course, we still have in, uh, international and national obligations to meet. Uh, and particularly if we look at the share of greenhouse gas emissions that are derived from agriculture in Ireland, uh, we're looking at in and around 35% of our total emissions profile coming from agriculture. So it doesn't reflect in any way uh, efficiency of the system or an inefficiency in the system. As I said, we have one of the most efficient systems. It simply reflects the scale of the sector in, in, in Ireland uh, and the absence of large scale manufacturing industries, which would be uh, much, much stronger in, in other European countries. So we're at in and around 35% as opposed to the EU average uh, of just over 10%. So we do have uh, we do have to, I suppose, take our share of the burden in terms of the reduction as well. So I suppose we need to, in terms of looking at mitigation options, first, uh, I suppose, present how do our farms generate greenhouse gas emissions? Well, the primary source or the primary gas of concern from the point of view of beef systems uh, and indeed of, of ruminant agricultural systems is methane gas. And about two thirds of total emissions from beef cattle production uh, derives from methane gas. And most of that uh, via a process called enteric fermentation. In other words, the digestion of, of forage uh, as the animal uh, uh, is, is uh, consuming feed, uh, digesting that feed and producing methane as a byproduct of that. We also have some methane uh, produced via liquid manure systems, but it's much smaller uh, when compared to enteric fermentation. Uh, 
The second gas of concern is nitrous oxide. Um, nitrous oxide is derived primarily from organic manures uh, and also from artificial nitrogen applied uh, on farms. And that would typically account for about 20% of our total emissions uh, on beef cattle production systems. And if we have a final category, a catch-all category, and I've converted them all to carbon dioxide equivalents, um, then that would account for about 13% of our, our total emissions. And that is predominantly the production of inputs. So the production of, of concentrate feed, uh, the production of, of fertilizers and so on. Uh, and of that 13%, 85% of it is from the production of inputs. There will also be other sources, the likes of uh, ammonia volatilization and nitrate leaching, all important uh, issues in and of their own right. But both of those give rise to downstream emissions of nitrous oxide. Uh, and we present that in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents here. So as I said, methane, the number one uh, gas that we, we need to address, also nitrous oxide and other uh, emissions uh, arising in beef systems. Presenting that another way, if we look at the lifetime uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and I'm gonna look at it in the context of suckler beef systems here, uh, and take a typical animal, uh, and a typical animal in Ireland that started in and around 27, 28 months of age. In the context of suckler beef systems, and if you look at the full production cycle, including the cow producing the calf and that calf taken through to slaughter at 28 months of age, the first overhead, if you like, uh, and an environmental overhead I, I, in this context is the cow itself. And that cow, when you apportion the emissions of that cow to its progeny and accounting for some of that being allocated to the cull beef of the animal as well, uh, is accounting for about two tonnes of CO2 equivalents uh, per, per progeny. The second category of emissions, I've mentioned it already, enteric fermentation. So the methane produced as a byproduct of, of forage digestion uh, accounts for approximately another uh, three tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents uh, in that animal's lifetime. Starting off at a very low level, uh, but increasing as the animal grows, consumes more forage and feed, uh, and peaks obviously close to slaughter. If we look at the other categories, they're, they're quite a bit smaller, manure and soils, uh, and finally other emissions, predominantly, as I said, the production of inputs. So how do we reduce those emissions? Well, if we first look at the dam related emissions, uh, and this is this bottom category here, so accounting for a, a sizable chunk of total emissions from uh, beef production. Well, there are a number of, of opportunities to, to reduce the dam related emissions. Uh, firstly, if we look at uh, a trait, aged first calving. Aged first calving can have a considerable impact uh, on, on methane emissions. If we look at the difference between 24 month calving, for example, and the, the national average of about 30 months, when that animal, when that cow is culled after, let's say, for example, having five calves, that animal in total will have had 80 months of life as opposed to a 30 month uh, age at calving, in which case that animal will have had 87 months of life. So that's a 7% difference uh, in terms of, of, of age at slaughter and obvious age at slaughter of the cull animal. And clearly that has implications for the emissions generated in that time. The number of calves per cow, you know, another way of looking at that, the number of cows required for every weanling we produce. At the moment, if we look at national average figures, we require about 116 cows for every 100 weanlings we produce. The target is to have 105, indeed 100 would be ideal, but allowing for some slippage and some mortality in the system, the target would be 105 cows for every 100 weanlings. So that's a difference of 11 cows for every 100 weanlings. And again, emissions being generated from those animals. We also want to breed for lower methane producing animals. Uh, and I'll deal with that a little bit more uh, in the next slide, which is looking specifically uh, at methane emissions. So methane emissions from the cow, uh, so enteric methane emissions from the cow and enteric methane emissions uh, from the progeny. Longer grazing seasons have a strong effect here. When the animal uh, is uh, in the shed on a grass silage diet in the indoor period, the amount of intake, if you, if you like, of that feed that is lost in energy terms uh, as methane gas is close to 10%. Whereas when that animal is on, at pasture on a grass-based diet, uh, the amount of that intake lost as methane gas, again, in energy terms, is about five or 6%. So longer grazing seasons having a strong effect uh, on total methane emissions. Obviously, within that, we still have some level of, of housing required and some indoor period. And in that period, then, it's the quality of the silage that will determine to a large extent 
uh, the amount of methane that's generated uh, during that period. The next two I've put in asterisks is because they are, I suppose, they're, they're longer term solutions. And I know we'll have a, a, have a clip from Professor Sinead Waters that will deal particularly with additives and supplementation uh, a little bit later. Uh, and that clearly, we want to have solutions further down the line. Uh, the first two points immediately uh, on our menu of options, uh, the additives and supplementation, particularly those at pasture taking a little bit longer uh, to bring to fruition. Breeding as well, happening in the background, always underpinning our performance, trying to breed for more efficient animals. And specifically now there's a program looking at breeding animals that produce, uh, produce less methane. Soils emissions, um, again, it's a smaller chunk, but still something that we need to be conscious of. And I think given the, the, the rising input cost, there'll be a much greater focus on this regardless uh, in the coming years. So nutrient management, are we applying uh, the, the right amount uh, at the right time, at the right rate, uh, and to the soils that require it most? So detailed nutrient management planning so that we most efficiently use the fertilizers that are available to us. Low emission slurry spreading. So we want to use the organic manure that we have on the farm and get the most out of that. Protected urea has been to the forefront, I suppose, in recent years in terms of an opportunity uh, to, reduce, uh, to reduce emissions from nitrogen fertilizers. And clover and legumes. Again, we're trying to reduce the requirement to purchase in uh, artificial nitrogen. So making better use and best use uh, of the, the ability of, of legumes to naturally fix uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere. There's also increasing interest in multi-species swords, both in terms of the legume component, but also the likes of plantain and chicory as, as an approach to sequester more carbon uh, and indeed to, to tap into to nutrients and I suppose uh, moisture at deeper, uh, at deeper soil levels. So a number of, of elements of research ongoing here at the moment. So when we move on to uh, age at slaughter as a management practice, what do we mean by that? Well, in principle, it's actually very, very straightforward. If we look at an animal at 28 months of age, producing about seven tons or a little over seven tons when we include the overhead of the, of the cow, reducing by a month, we're taking off about 250 kilos. Uh, another month, about another 250 kilos or thereabouts of CO2 equivalents. So all we're doing here in this case is we're moving this line down further. So if we get to 26 months, we're obviously down where this line is, and we want to get this as low as possible. If we quantify that in terms of what is achievable and put that across about a million and a half prime animals that are slaughtered in Ireland every year, each month equates to about 0.2 to 0.3 million tons or megatons of CO2 equivalents of methane. If we include the reductions in soils emissions and other indirect emissions. So in other words, the emissions associated with purchasing and fertilizers and so on, the emissions associated with ammonia volatilization and nitrate leaching, this increases to between 0.3 and 0.5 megatons of CO2 equivalents for each month uh, reduction in slaughter age. So there is quite a, a substantial opportunity here uh, to, to reduce uh, emissions by slaughtering our cattle earlier. But as I said, we need to be careful in terms of you know, how we achieve this. And some important considerations in this regard are, I suppose, first and foremost, the financial implications. You know, where we change system, where we look at alternative slaughter ages, impacts on carcass weights, impacts on feeding systems. And this all feeds in, uh, in a very significant way to, to a financial analysis and financial implications of, of, of making that change. In terms of the, ch the, ch uh, the change in the feed budget, we have to look at how that slaughter early or slaughter age is achieved. Is it due to meal feeding? Because obviously we have greenhouse gas emissions from the production of concentrate ration. So we need to take that into consideration. There's also the important uh, issue of our perception. And not only the perception, it's the reality of Irish beef as a grass-fed model. And we don't want to, I suppose, jeopardize that, that image. Uh, and indeed, we don't want to under, undermine uh, that, that marketing tool that we have uh, of Irish beef as a grass-fed system. And of course, feed intake is also uh, he heavily influenced, uh, or methane is heavily inf influenced by feed intake. So we need to take all of these into account when we analyze what the implications of earlier slaughter are uh, on methane emissions. So I'm gonna look at one piece of work. Uh, we have a number of different studies, uh, but this is just one I think that, that, that indicates the, I suppose the kind of implications that we are faced with when it comes to looking at a systems comparison. This work was carried out by Maeve Regan, who was a student at Grange. 
uh, working with Mark McGee, uh, Eddie O'Reardon and Aidan Maloney. Uh, and what they looked at here in this system were four different comparisons in terms of production systems with implications for feeding management and slaughter age. The first system was uh, grass only at 20 months. In other words, these were weanlings purchased, uh, turned out to grass and finished at 20 months of age. And you can see here carcass weight 295 kilos uh, and just missing the target in terms of fat score. These were late maturing animals. If we look at the, the comparison, so say another cohort of these animals were then housed. So were well, grass only at 24 months of age. So grass only for the uh, second season at pasture, turned into the shed and grass silage only in the shed finishing period. We're adding about 25 kilos of, uh, or yeah, 25 kilos of carcass and we're getting a little bit better on fat score. So we're just on our target for fat score. Now let's add concentrate to this system. So now we have grass only in the second grazing season and we have grass silage plus concentrate during the finishing period. In this case, we're adding 50 kilos plus uh, of carcass and now we're very comfortably inside the range uh, for fat score. And this would be quite a standard system on a lot of farms. And the final comparison we have here is grass only at 28 months of age. So we have grass only for uh, the second grazing season, housed and fed grass silage only for the uh, second winter, turned back out for a toad grazing season, and again, receiving grass only in that toad grazing season. So in this case, we're increasing our carcass weight by another 20 kilos plus, uh, and we're still on target for fat score. So what these bars show are total emissions produced per animal across those four systems. And we can see if we look at these first two uh, bars on the left hand side, grass only being considerably lower in terms of emissions than grass only at 24 months of age. So grass only 20, about two tonnes, grass only 24, uh, about um, three tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents. So, you know, a very strong impact uh, of aged slaughter in, in that case. But of course, as I said, struggling to reach the fat score target in the grass only system at 20 months. When we compare our grass only at 24 months, so at two years of age, with and without concentrates, you can see the effect of concentrates on total emissions produced per head. So we go from three tons of carbon per head to about four tons of carbon per head. So a very substantial impact uh, on total greenhouse gas emissions produced in this case, due to the additional concentrate feeding uh, and the methane emissions produced per head arising from that. But of course, we're much better on, uh, on, on carcass weight and we're much better on uh, meeting our carcass fat score as well in that system. So let's look at our final uh, uh, move. So we go from 24 months, killing at two years of age on a grass silage concentrate diet to going out to pasture and grass only. And I suppose the important thing here is we've added four months of age to the animal's life, but in fact, we haven't increased their emissions at all. The emissions are the same. Uh, we are slightly heavier uh, and we're, as I said, we're, we're, we're bang on in terms of our fat score target. And this is really important in terms of how we achieve our age at slaughter. We, if we move from going in the other direction from 28 months to 24 months, we can shave off four months, but if we put in feed, then we mightn't get the greenhouse gas emission savings that we require. Not only that, but if we look at it on a footprint basis, if we look at the emissions per kilo of beef produced, these animals actually have a lower uh, carbon footprint or emissions intensity. So the amount of greenhouse gas produced per kilo of beef produced. And this is a really important message for us as well. And I suppose uh, for the work carried out by uh, Peter Doyle, who has looked at similar type of systems, but also included an economic analysis shows that those 28 month systems on a per head basis are very competitive financially as well. Uh, on a per hectare basis where you kill earlier, you have an opportunity to carry more of them and therefore you have an opportunity to, to increase your margins per hectare. On a per head basis, these grass only systems or, or high grass systems that in the toad grazing season uh, certainly can be can be very competitive. And this work, this particular piece of analysis was uh, analyzed by uh, Jonathan Heron uh, and published earlier this year. So what does that mean or what are the implications of that in terms of our national slaughter profile? Because yes, we do want to advance slaughter age. We want to slaughter the animals earlier, 
but we don't want that to include a system change which incorporates meal feeding. So now we have to look in a little bit more detail uh, at the national starter profile. And I, there are a number of different categories. I'm not going to look at them all. I'm just going to take Frisian steers as one example. In this case, I'm going to look at Springborn Frisian steers slaughtered last year. The average slaughter age for those animals was 28 months, and I suppose, or 27.6 months. And I suppose I should make the point here that that is, that is actually 60 days earlier than 2011. So we're already making very uh, good progress in terms of slaughter age. We've advanced it by two months uh, in the last 10 years. Carcass weight, no change. So 325 kilos. So we have, we've, 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 we've increased or reduced our slaughter age by 60 days with no reduction or no change in carcass weight. There is a small drop in confirmation. It's 0.4 on a 15 pint scale. So in practical terms, it's very small, uh, but it is uh, trending slightly in the wrong direction. So let's look at this in terms of the total animal numbers. Firstly, looking at carcass weight, as you would expect, and at the, uh, and the horizontal axis, I'm looking at age at slaughter. As animals go from 20 to 36 months of age, as you would expect, as animals are older, their, the carcass weight uh, is heavier. So older at slaughter equals heavier carcasses. And that, that's pretty much uh, what we would expect. The other thing I want to look at here is, you know, the number of animals killed at these various uh, month thresholds. So you can see the, the profile uh, of, for the number of animals slaughtered. Peaks here at about 30 months or 29 months of age. So clearly showing that the signals giving, given by the meat industry in terms of a slaughter age less than 30 months is very effective. We see that after the 30 months of age, it drops off very rapidly and much smaller numbers killed uh, uh, at over 30 months of age. We also notice here this uh, peak at about 24 months of age. So in terms of the color coding that we're looking at here, the yellow bars indicate animals that are finished in the shed. The green bars indicates animals that are finished at pasture. We don't obviously have information on you know, feeding practices for these particular animals, but we do know that where they're finished in the winter period, they're more likely to be finished out of the shed or almost certain to be finished out of the shed. Uh, and where they're finished during the summer period, uh, they're almost certain to be uh, finished at pasture. We also have these dashed lines where they're finished between shed finishing period uh, and pasture finishing period. So we can't be certain uh, when these animals are being slaughtered. Some will be slaughtered out of the shed uh, and some will be sl slaughtered at grass. So I suppose the low hanging fruit here are very clearly these 36,000 animals that are killed at over 30 months of age. But we also have opportunities with other categories. These animals at 22 to 23 months of age, can we slaughter them earlier? I think it's going to be very challenging. We know the breed types we're talking about here. We already seen challenges in terms of, of fat score, probably challenging, but possible uh, to move some of these animals into the earlier slaughter uh, age group and thereby reducing age at slaughter and maybe some of them uh, coming off grass uh, in the second uh, grazing season. But again, very challenging for the breed type that we're talking about here. Um, as I said, the low hanging fruit very clearly, these animals over 30 months of age, particularly those animals over 30 months of age that are going into a, a, a toward, sea, or toward uh, winter in the shed. If we can bring these back to grass finished and even further than that, we have very substantial opportunities to re reduce age at slaughter. And probably the category that we need to be most careful about is this category, these early toward season finished animals. Uh, we do want them to finish earlier, but we don't want them to move into a shed finishing phase because we'll be adding emissions associated with the concentrate feeding. Uh, we'll be adding cost in terms of the production of those animals. So the message being that we need to be very careful about how we uh, advance slaughter age uh, for some of these categories of animals. Um, so that's Frisian steers. I won't go through this. This is the very same message for suckler steers. Uh, in this case, we have fewer of them finished over 30 months of age, 24,000, but there's still opportunities within those categories and I could make the very same points. Uh, in terms of slaughter age, about 29 months of age, uh, in this case, a month and a half earlier than 2011. Uh, so we've advanced slaughter age by, by um, you know, that 45 days with indeed an 11 kilo increase in carcass weight, so up to 407. So we're killing earlier and heavier. Uh, so good advances made and indeed small increase in confirmation uh, in that time period as well. So what we want is, I suppose, effectively efficient reduction in slaughter ages. We want to advance slaughter age, but we want to do that efficiently. And what do we mean by that? Well, if we look at 
you know, the type of practices that will reduce slaughter age efficiently. Number one tool is management. You know, how we manage uh, our animals. And, you know, we have, we have two programs that have been launched recently, the Future Beef Program, the Dairy Beef 500 Program for focusing on suckler and the dairy beef uh, um, animals that are, that are coming for slaughter. Uh, and those will focus on opportunities around management to produce these animals as efficiently as possible and to reduce age at slaughter. And really, I think above all else, management is how we will, we will, we will make the, the greatest advances. And that's in terms of, of the quality of feed that's been offered, uh, in terms of general husbandry practices, uh, in terms of in a, in a dairy beef scenario, the, the, the purchase criteria and health around purchase, uh, the transition feeding uh, in, the, in the first uh, uh, period of calf rearing, and so on. So there are, there are great opportunities around management. And I think that is where the, the, the largest gains will be found. Of course, health is really important and it ties in very closely with, uh, uh, with management. You know, biosecurity being number one, we don't want to introduce health issues on the farm first and foremost. If we do uh, suspect health issues, then diagnostics and identifying specifically what the issue is uh, and then going in and treating that issue. And of course, vaccination as a, as a buttress to all of that to ensure that we have the highest health status possible on our farm. And there are a number of, of, of programs, Animal Health Ireland programs, Beef Health Check, uh, Calf Care, uh, and the Parasite Control Program, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of programs around health that are really important in terms of, you know, having the healthiest animals, that means we can achieve our earlier slaughter ages. And finally, happening in the background uh, and continuing to advance slaughter ages, genetics and breeding. Uh, there was a paper published by my colleague Donna Berry uh, a number of years ago uh, in collaboration with uh, colleagues in, in the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation that looked at the genetic variability that exists and to see what advances are there genetically uh, to, to, a, to shorten age at slaughter. And you can see here in terms of the, of the bell curve that all of the breeds have a lot of variation, large exploitable genetic variation as it's termed, uh, and therefore we have an opportunity to advance slaughter age genetically, as well as all the other practices that I have highlighted here. So Chairman, uh, my, my final slide, I suppose, just in, in summary, we have been set a reduction target of five to seven megatons. The director covered this very well on, on, on Monday evening session. Um, you know, we have a number of tools, a number of, of programs that, are, that we have set out to, I suppose, help us to achieve that. And the most ef effective approach is to reduce emissions through better and higher levels of, of farm efficiency. Slaughter age is an approach. There is potential there of somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 megatons per month. Um, but we need to be careful in terms of how we achieve that. And certainly concentrate feeding would tend to offset some of these reductions. Sustainable reductions, what we're looking at is levels of management, higher levels of management, good herd health and genetic improvement. All of these happening in the background uh, will enable us to sustainably reduce slaughter age to achieve our targets. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. And, and, and just as a, as, as a summary from, from, from a viewer's perspective, what I'm hearing for you is that done properly and managed carefully, it is possible without impacting on the economics of production, it is possible to reduce on average uh, slaughter age. Absolutely. Yep. And that's, and that's the key point, uh, Matt, is that we need, to, we need to be sure that what we are doing, we do it as efficiently as possible. We don't want to be introducing inefficiencies into the system. We don't want to be introducing costs into the system. We want slaughter age. Certainly, there's an opportunity there, particularly within the system. So if you're slaughtering out of the shed at 25, 26 months, can you move that forward a couple of months to 23, 24 months? Equally, if you're slaughtering at grass at 26, 27, 28 months, can we take a couple of months uh, off that system as well? So that's that's really the challenge that we have. Okay, I'm just going to bring in our other panelists at the moment. I'm going to ask Paul another question, but uh, we'll bring in uh, uh, Professor uh, O'Mara, the newly appointed director of Chagask, and Dr. Kevin Hanrahan of the Chagask Rural Economic uh, Rural Economy Development Program. Sorry, that's a long-winded title, Kevin. There you go. Paul, I, I, I'm not I, I, into backslapping or anything, but that benchmark um, slide you put up initially, given that we're skewed because we have a low industrial base, we're still doing quite well in terms of carbon efficiency internationally. 
Absolutely. And I mean, that's a key point. We have to you have to keep in the in the forefront of our minds at all time that we are doing a really, really good job. It's not a license not to, um, you know, not to to make efforts to reduce our emissions. Of course, we have to we have to uh, take our share of the, you know, the, the national you know challenge to reduce emissions. But we already have a very efficient system. If we look at it in international terms, you know, Irish systems in and around 20 kilos of CO2 equivalents per, for each kilo of beef, the global average in the mid 40s. You know, so that's a that's a really important point, particularly in the context of, you know, a situation where we have a growing global demand for beef. We're currently consuming about 60 million tons of beef. The expectation you, looking at FAO projections is that that will go to either 70 or 80 million tons. If you take a high uh, growth scenario or a low growth scenario, we will have to be producing about an extra 10 or 20 million tons of beef by 2030. So certainly, you know, contracting beef in, in efficient countries is not the solution globally uh, to reducing emissions. So we, we have to be very careful in terms of the global uh, context here. Okay, there are, uh, there are a number of questions coming in already and I'll, I'll distribute them as we go through the evening. But uh, just to remind people who might have arrived late, as I said earlier, there's a, a facility to put your questions uh, to the panelists uh, at the bottom of the screen. So just type in your questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Before we proceed any further, I do want to uh, introduce a, a video of a new flagship uh, farm demonstration program uh, called Future Beef. Uh, in, and in the video, uh, the program manager of Future Beef, Martina Harrington, will outline what is involved. Just a short video to set things in context. My name is Martina Harrington and I'm the manager of the new Future Beef programme. The new Future Beef programme is a demonstration farm programme of 24 mainly suckler beef producers right across Ireland, running from Banno down in County Wexford up to Manor Hamilton here in Leitrim and down again to Drimmer League in County Cork. Over the next five years the Future Beef team will be working with the local farmers and the local advisors to really drive on efficiencies on these farms and to look at adoption of new technologies onto farms to improve really what we're talking about is profitability first and then we're going to be looking at how we can reduce the greenhouse gases of every every kilo of beef that's been sold off those farms. We're also going to look at improving water quality and looking at, bio, and looking at improving biodiversity on these farms. We believe that if farmers can see these efficiencies and technologies working on the future beef farms that they're more likely to adapt them onto their own farms as these future beef farms are all in the same locations and they are facing the same challenges as your farm and once all these technologies are taken up wholesale we can really push forward the whole beef industry to see what farmers are involved in the program and to see their farms please look at the Chagas Future Beef website and for updates in the new year check out the website and all Chagas social media thank you to Martina for that short but concise uh, presentation. Uh, Frank O'Mara, I've always been a, a fan of farm-led research and, and demonstration, and, and that epitomizes it. Absolutely, Matt. Look, this is the program we just launched there on Monday. It's all about, uh, you know, working with farmers and looking at what's important to them. And, and obviously, you know, greenhouse gas is a very important issue now. But for individual farms and for the industry as a whole, it's, you know, it's really important that profitability is, is centre stage as well. So we'll be working with these farmers to, uh, you know, I suppose, implement best practice, to implement uh, efficiencies, to implement technologies on their farms that contribute both to their profitability and their livelihoods, but also contribute to better outcomes in terms of, of climate change. And um, look, it's a, it's a, a big program for us. We, we, we hope it's, it's going to have a big impact with farmers. We'd encourage all farmers to kind of follow it and, and follow their, their neighboring farmer, whoever is involved in it. And look, I'd like to thank the, the, um, the meat industry who put up a lot of funding to help us put this program in place. And to my colleagues there, Martina and, and Gabriel and Ashling, who are going to be working on this program over the next, uh, next four or five years. OK, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Frank. B back to you, Paul. Just I, I'm taking these questions as they come. Will reducing slaughterage increase carbon age? I, I, I presume it's carbon output per kilo of beef. Is this a trade off? Uh, not necessarily, no. I mean, what we want to try and do is is reduce if we reduce slaughterage efficiently, then we reduce slaughterage and reduce emissions per kilo of beef. So we, we want to avoid that's precisely the trade off that we want to avoid. Um, I suppose the complexity of the accounting methodology means that the kilos of beef aren't considered, I suppose, in terms of how we uh, account for our methane reductions or our total emissions reductions. 
we're just looking at the emissions uh, in, in isolation from the beef, but of course, from the point of view of marketing and from the point of view of, of how our farmers are performing, it's per kilo of beef that we're interested in as well. So we do need to, to achieve both. And the only way we will do that is by having, you know, that reduction being achieved as efficiently as possible. Okay, another question coming in. It's the whole idea of, of, of finishing at grass and introducing meal at grass. Yeah, very good opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. A very good opportunity to do that. You know, if we can advance slaughter age by feeding meal at grass, uh, then we're trying to, I suppose, we're trying to make the best of both uh, worlds, if you like, so that we're getting earlier slaughter, we're getting some of that dietary component is a pasture-based component, uh, and some of that is a, is a concentrate-based component. So absolutely, particularly for some of the maybe more earlier maturing breed types, uh, where you have opportunities to finish in a second season, uh, and from an economic point of view, you're, you're, you're I suppose, uh, alleviating the need to go into the shed for a second winter. So we have to look at the economics as well. And certainly there are very good opportunities by, by, comp or by supplementing a grass. OK. Um, will carbon sequestration offset the carbon emissions? Um, perhaps back to you, uh, Frank, on that, this whole idea that there's a balance and, and you work ongoing. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we've we've a lot of work ongoing on the whole area of carbon sequestration, and it's a question that's often asked. Well, you know, can can that offset the emissions on on my farm? And look, it's a complicated answer. Um, I suppose the the just to give you know some broad figures, you know, we published a report the other day based on on the National Farm Survey, and the average emissions. Just look at the, the emissions on a on a beef farm are somewhere around four tonnes per hectare. When you take in all the things Paul talked about there, you know, the cow, the animal, the, the livestock, the fertiliser and so on. And I suppose, you know, on a, on a mineral soil, a good mineral soil, you might be offsetting somewhere around, you know, a tonne, a tonne and a half of that through carbon sequestration. But the not all soils are the same and there's huge variability between soils, between different farms. And some of our soils actually are emitting carbon. And, you know, drained peat soils actually emit a lot of carbon per, per hectare, way more than the, the animals mm. that might be grazing on, on that. So there, there's no offsetting in that situation. And at, at the moment, uh, we don't have individual allocations of greenhouse gas emissions per farm. You know, we don't bring this down to a per farm level. Um, you know, we have a country target. And as Paul outlined there at the start, the, 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 the target for agriculture for the overall country is to reduce emissions from, from 23 million tonnes down to 18 million tonnes. And unfortunately, when we look at carbon sequestration then in the round for, for all the agriculture, it's actually not sequestering carbon. Overall, agricultural soils are emitting carbon. So on some, while on some farms, there, there, there definitely is some level of offsetting that's going on, maybe, maybe quite a bit of offsetting. On, on other farms, then there's actually extra emissions that are adding to that 23 million tonnes. So, so it's, it's a complicated picture. And I suppose at the moment, um, as I said, it's, it's not down to a per farm level. Like we're not saying to individual farms, that's, that's your emissions uh, per, per, per farm and you've got to reduce them by, by 30% or whatever. So, so wh when we look at it in the round, sequestration is important uh, and it's going to be really important that we try to increase it over the coming years. But um, as yet, it's not in a position to kind of offset the agricultural emissions to any huge extent. OK, let's broaden this out uh, because uh, we're getting a flow of information coming out of Chagas recently in terms of uh, particularly yesterday's outlook uh, for, the, for the year ahead and indeed the year gone by. Kevin Hanrahan, where is beef production this year in terms of profitability and, and what's the outlook? Well, this year was a quite a good year. We had uh, higher prices for finished cattle and higher prices for stores and weaning. So um, in the terms of the farm systems we use in the National Farm Survey to, to, to talk about beef farms, uh, cattle rearing and cattle finishing systems both saw improved margins and, and improved family farm income levels that, yeah, well, the cattle finishers maintained their income um, and that was, they didn't see an improvement largely because the, uh, the coupled payments that were there last year weren't there this year because prices were relatively good. Um, the, the downside, of, I suppose, of the year that was, was that farmers got better prices but they also paid higher prices for their inputs. Uh, feed prices were up, fertilizer prices were up. So those higher costs of production offset some of the gain in the output value that most farmers would have achieved from the animals that they were marketing in 2021. I guess as we look to next year, um, 
the headwinds are much, much stronger. Um, we don't think there will be dramatic changes in the price of cattle uh, at a global level. Uh, supply and use is quite tight. Uh, we're all reading the paper about the problems of getting goods in general, including meat uh, and, and, and oil and natural gas shipped around the world. And that's going to mean that the sort of the competitive pressures from Southern Hemisphere producers of beef into the European market are going to be quite quite hard for them to get lots of product into the European market. So we don't think there's going to be a big change in the supply and use balance uh, in, in Europe that will drive a big change in, in the price of cattle. But what's really happening, and it's really going to cause big problems for incomes next year in, in, in cattle farms in particular, are much higher cost of production. So we're looking at fertilizer prices that look like they're going to possibly average well over 100% higher in 2022 than they were in 2021. And they were already higher in 21 than they were in 20. So but it's this is an enormous price shock that we're looking at right now. And as we look to what's driving that price shock in fertilizers in particular, it's, it's what's happening on natural gas markets. And the futures market prices for natural gas through the first and second and most of the second quarter of next year are, are remaining high. And what that means is that the, those costs of production for grassland systems in general are, are going to be very elevated next year. And that's really going to dramatically eat into the profits that farmers can expect to make from their, from their beef business. And for cattle farmers, we know it's a relatively low margin business. So when, when an input like fertilizer or, or your feed costs are going up, and going up quite significantly. And there's very little you can do about it. You can economize in your fertilizer use. You can use your slurry very carefully. You can manage your silage stocks. Um, the, what you're left over with in terms of the profit that you're making, the income you're making from that activity is gonna be much smaller next year. We're talking about um, profit levels, basically all that was gained this year, basically being lost again next year because of that big increase in cost of production. Okay, we're looking at uh, hopefully relative uh, price buoyancy, but a huge, huge cost challenges uh, coming yep. through. Back to you, Paul. Another question here. Uh, what role does bull beef have slaughtered at 20 months? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, 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 it's an old challenge. Hmm. When you have them, nobody wants them, and then everybody says they're a, they're a solution. Well, that, that's exactly the point, Matt, I suppose. You know, certainly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, bull beef provides a very good opportunity, a really strong opportunity to reduce our emissions. They're more efficient and they're typically slaughtered earlier. Or they're, 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 they certainly would provide you with a good opportunity to reduce slaughter rate if we look at an under 16 month bull system uh, or a 20 month bull system. But the reality is we have a small market for, or a much smaller market for bull beef. So again, it comes back to the, to the, to the sustainability of the system. It's not sustainable if we, if we haven't a buyer for our product. You know, we have to produce a product we have to produce it sustainably and we have to have a product uh, that we have a market for. As I said, we do have a market for a certain amount of bull beef uh, and that fluctuates slightly from year to year, uh, but it's a much, much smaller market than we have for our, our steer beef systems. Yeah, I mean, it is an obvious theoretical winner, a 20 month or, or 16 month beef, but uh, the market just doesn't seem to be able to cope with it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our market is for, you know, grass fed steer beef. That's, that's how we're, that's how we trade ourselves. That's how we market ourselves. And that's what our customers want. Um, of course, as I said, we, we, we have analysis and we have looked at bull beef systems and we have looked at the greenhouse gas emissions from those systems and the emissions intensities would, would reduce by about, you know, 10 to 15% in those systems. Uh, but again, if we don't have a market for those, uh, then it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of an academic question. Okay, I promised uh, we'd have a second short video on emerging technologies and we'll perhaps get uh, Frank to, to comment further on them after, after we've seen it. the whole area of uh, the potential of feed additives and breeding for, for, for methane uh, reductions. And, and, and Paul hit on those as, uh, during his presentation. So this is just a short video presentation from Dr. Sinead Waters, a research scientist with Chagask, if we could have that. So methane is a greenhouse gas which accounts for the majority uh, of greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. It's actually at a level of around 60%. So methane is harmful because it's 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Its sources include enteric fermentation or the feed digestion from cattle and stored slurries and manures. So how is methane produced? 
The digestive system of cattle contain a microbial ecosystem called the rumen microbiome. And this microbiome converts grass and feed into energy source for the animal. However, they also produce methane as a byproduct of this fermentation process. It's produced by a group of microbes called the methanogens. And then it's released into the atmosphere from the rumen via the animal's breath. It's also produced during the storage of manure and slurry by these same methanogens. Ongoing research in Chagask is now focused on reducing methane emissions from beef production using two main approaches. Firstly, by developing feed additives and then by breeding initiatives to reduce methane emissions. One of our projects, which was recently funded by the Department of Agriculture, called Methabate, aims to develop farm-ready technologies to reduce methane emissions from ruminant fermentation and stored manure and slurries. They include a number of feed supplements such as 3NOP, halides, seaweeds and oils. Our research will investigate the effectiveness of these supplements to reduce methane emissions in the laboratory, first of all, using a rumen simulation technique. We will also plan to measure how effective these additives are in reducing methane from beef cattle and try then to understand the mechanism of action of these supplements using a range of sequencing technologies. It will be critical that we examine if the abatement strategy persists and are effective long term. Also, are they cost effective? We also need to ensure that any compounds used as a methane abatement strategy in Irish agriculture are safe for animals and humans and do not result in any toxic residues in meat products. We're also involved in exciting research with our collaborators in the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation at Tully Performance Testing Station in County Kildare, where strategies are being developed to breed cattle with a lower environmental footprint, ultimately improving beef sustainability. Thanks to Sinead. Uh, Frank, if I, if I could put it to you, are these potentially game-changing technologies or is it much too early to speculate? Look, Matt, I think this is really important work that Sinead was outlining there. I suppose looking, looking at some of the questions coming in on the chat, you know, and there, there obviously was a lot of comment in the media over the last month about the, the national herd and did we need to reduce the number of animals and, and so on and so forth. And people are probably fed up hearing uh, that kind of a, um, a proposition put forward. It's our proposition in Chagas that there's a way to reach these emissions cuts uh, through efficiency and technology and that we don't need to reduce the national herd. So I suppose, you know, we, we have already, um, as I outlined on Monday night, you know, we have a suite of technologies that we can already implement, but we are going to need more uh, technologies to get us the full way to that um, five to seven million tons of reduction that, that Paul outlined at the start. And the work that Sinead talked about here in terms of developing feed additives to reduce methane is really, really important. And, you know, around the world, there's a lot of interest in, in, in being able to do that. And um, the second uh, avenue that she talked about was trying to breed low emitting animals. So an animal that regardless of how long it's kept, you know, it lives for that every day that it's alive, it's actually breathing out less methane. And, and those two strategies, along with the things we've talked about tonight, you know, the earlier slaughter, and along with things like, you know, taking nitrogen out of the system by, by clover or by better nutrient management or, or better use of your organic manures and things like protected urea and so on. Between all those technologies, yes, we think there's a pathway there to reaching these targets. So that work that Sinead was doing, while it's not ready to, to apply yet on, on farms, um, it's early stage research. It is very, very important work for the future. Yeah, just a, a quick clarification, if you, if you will, Frank. I can see that uh, the, the genetic potential is there to, to breed lower emitting animals. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's already proven and it'll be a, a slow burner. It'll happen over time. The feed additives, though, I'd, I'd still query their, their longevity, perhaps. You know, we really don't know how long they would be effective in, in the animal. Yeah, so look, or the that's cost, type, indeed. Uh, exactly. They're all questions that we have to answer by, by research. And I suppose, you know, there, there's lots of things that people talk about, you know, every every couple of months, somebody come, comes out with a story on seaweed as the next great solution or some other feed additive that's that's going to do the devil and all. And I suppose to date, there's really is, is only one product that's kind of at, you know, almost at the point of being ready to, to use on farms. Uh, that That's a product developed in, in the Netherlands called, called Bovair. Uh, we've done work on it ourselves here. It looks very promising, you know, reductions in methane of up to 30%. Um, 
But look, uh, what, one of the issues with it is that it has to be fed continuously. So it's only really suitable for an indoor feeding situation. So while that might be useful in some circumstances in Ireland, obviously we need a version that, that would, would work at pasture where it has to be fed a lot less frequently. And um, obviously then, as you said, Matt, there's the issue of the cost of this. So, so look, there, there's, there's a good bit of research needed in these, but I think we're going to need every avenue that, that we can find really to, to tackle uh, this particular nut of methane. Okay, back to back to you, Paul. Um, there's been a lot of debate over dairy calf to beef versus the 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 suckler cow. Where does where does the 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 dairy cow fit into the equation when you're when you're doing up the sums, if you like? Yeah, it's it's a good question, Matt, and and it comes up quite a bit. So we allocate the emissions of the cow to the progeny to the beef based typically on the economic value of the output of that animal. So clearly on the, on the beef scenario, all of the emissions from the cow is allocated to beef, either to cull beef or to the progeny beef. So that's, that's a straightforward exercise. In the case of a dairy beef scenario, the cow has both milk product output and beef product output. So we have to allocate the emissions to both. As I said, there are, there, there are a number of different ways, but the most common way and the most straightforward way is to allocate it on an economic basis. So the value of meat produced uh, compared with the value of uh, of of of, of uh, milk versus beef, uh, and in that case, normally 85 to 90 percent of the emissions are allocated to milk, which is the primary output, uh, and the remainder is allocated to the calf and to the beef uh, produced in that system. Frank, you wanted to come back there on that. Just to come in briefly on that, Matt. Look, it, it's it's a question as Paul said often comes up. You know, dairy beef versus suckler beef, which is the most carbon efficient. And look, I, I don't think that's that's really the, that's the right question to be asking. I think you know we we have to find ways whether it's dairy beef or suckler beef. We have to find ways of producing that efficiently, profitably, and with less carbon. And it's not one versus the other. Both have a have a place to play in in the Irish beef industry. And both, we, as I said, we have to find ways to produce them efficiently, profitably, and with less emissions. Kevin, coming back over to you then on the whole economics of dairy calf to beef versus uh, the 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 suckler, and um, possibly even throw in the the challenges that are there for, for cattle farmers in terms of, of in improving profitability? Is it scale? Is it management? Is it, is it land type? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think looking forward, which is what we, we do regularly, I think the, I think we're, we're unlikely to see growth in the suckle cow herd given the profitability uh, situation. I, I think we're likely to see over the next 10 years, some, some slow but steady decline in, in suckle, suckle numbers, but you know the, the the death of the sucker industry is, is has been pronounced so many times. I, I just I just don't pay any attention to it anymore. I don't. I think it's it, there's good reasons why we have and we continue to have hundreds and of thousands of sucker cows and, and thousands of farmers engaged in the, in the system. Um, we've seen a do increase in the supply of beef out of the out of the out of the dairy herd, and I think over time the the ratio of 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 the, the beef progeny to the dairy, the progeny of the dairy herd is going to shift more, continue to shift more towards the dairy herd. Um, I don't think, we're, I think we're probably going to see a slower rate of growth in the dairy cow herd. So we, you know, we're not going to continue in a linear fashion in the growth we've seen because it's going to get more expensive to grow continuously. And because if it continues to grow, there probably will be some constraints introduced into the system to, to, to stop that for, amongst other reasons, greenhouse gas uh, and the ambitions to reduce our greenhouse gases. I mean, at the farm level, farmers aren't going to be able to change their soil type very easily. So, you know, telling somebody to intensify if they've got very wet soil uh, or very difficult uh, soil conditions, uh, you know, just doesn't make any sense. So I think it's going to be about some of the things that, that Paul actually talked about in his, in his paper, um, you know, getting as many calves per sucker cow as you can. You know, ideally, we want a calf per cow per year is sort of the mantra I've heard Paul mention once or twice. But we certainly need to get it down from that, that sort of uh, 106, you know, 100 cows per 116 cows where we're at at the moment. We need to get it a lot lower than that because that's just you're just carrying an enormous cost in your system and not getting enough output out, out of the cow. So things like that, which Chagast uh, Advisory and, and research have been, have been helping farmers to improve on for years. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, all the cattle specialists and advisors out there or we'd be more than happy to help farms think about how their system can get a bit better in terms of its technical performance, because some of those technical improvements that will reduce the, um, the emissions intensity of, 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 the, of the cattle system are also ones that will improve your bottom line as well. So 
I think pretty much a lot of the, a lot of the technology that will make farmers better off, a lot of the management practices are the ones that 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 Chagas research and advice have been been helping farmers think about and do on their farms for many years. And I think we just need to get just improve a little bit. Not everyone is going to going to be above average, but improve the average performance level a little bit, and that that that'll augment the incomes on farms. But unfortunately, it will not transform them to earning incomes that are that are of the scale that uh, are being earned in the wider economy and on some on some farms that, that are out there like the average dairy farm um, that requires will require structural change um, and that that that's a big choice for a farm family to make to get out of farming and it's not one that many are making okay next question i think it'll be directed to to both kevin and paul because you've both mentioned some of the issues involved with the increase in fertilizer prices farmers will have no option to reduce numbers slash throughput of stock this will effectively lead to the average herd age increasing and stock will be pushed over 30 months coming in, come, come in from uh, Edmund Graham. That, that, that is a difficulty as costs increase, is it? Uh, or it may be just a short term cost surge. Um, Paul, perhaps first. Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really good point. And it's, 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 an, it's, it's one that's facing us uh, directly in the face uh, coming into next, next year, you know, in terms of fertilizer and input prices. What I would say is that, you know, the beef sector in terms of its fertilizer use uh, is, is, is much lower uh, than, than the other sectors. And so we'll be buffeted to some extent from, from that point of view. Uh, obviously, silage production is where you will get the, the, the greatest um, impact in terms of cost and, and fertilizer requirement. I think what we'll see next year is a much greater focus on the, 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 the free fertilizer, if you like, that we have available to us. The organic manures on the farm, the slurry, so the application of that, the value of that as a nutrient source on the farm will come much more to the fore. The use of the likes of low emission slurry technologies, not just in terms of, of, of meeting climate obligations, but also in terms of making the best use of the nutrients in that slurry. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't offset the challenge that we face. Uh, clearly, we will have to, uh, you know, face into a very high uh, uh, fertilizer price year next year. But there are, you know, good opportunities to reduce that in the short term uh, using, using uh, slurries on the farm. And then in the long term, looking again at clover and legumes as an approach to, to get some of that free nitrogen, if you like, that's available from the atmosphere and fixed in our soils. So we do have challenges, uh, but there are also solutions to those challenges. Okay, Kevin, as an economist, you, you study cause and potential effects all the time. This is, this is a classic example. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the, the law of economics will suggest that people will 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 reduce their use of nitrogen next year, like the chemical for, uh, and uh, in response to very high prices. And I think that will make economic sense. And um, the challenge will, as, as as the question says, is you know what's going to happen to your farm's ability to produce the same quantity of output. Out of, you know, if, if if we take this input out of the system. And nothing else changes. We, you know, you should expect that there'll be less out the other side. It's 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 kind of physics basically. And I think the the, the, the our focus next year, as Paul is saying, is about using the resources we have on farm much more carefully, and being, you know, basically maybe paying a little bit more attention to trying to basically do things as well as you can. Um, and uh, I think Chagas will be promoting. Uh, will have be having campaigns. Uh, around that so as to ensure that insofar as possible we can get through this um, very, very high price environment on the input side without totally compromising or having seen big negative effects on either our efficiency or production systems or on the on the volume of, of, of food that we produce in Irish agriculture. Frank, a brief comment from you. Yeah, Matt, I just wanted to say that, look, I, I'm in this job now about two months and the first thing, uh, the first conversation I had with the minister was about this issue. And he asked us to look at look at this, obviously aware of the potential impact it's going to have next year. And um, I suppose we will be bringing out or bringing forward a campaign next spring about how to make the maximum, absolute maximum use of the organic manures, the slurry, the farmyard manure produced on your farm or indeed on, on a neighboring farm to try to, to um, reduce the impact of these higher fertilizer prices. And for whatever nitrogen fertilizer, you know, chemical fertilizer you do use that you get the absolute maximum value back back out of that it's going to be a very expensive commodity we're going to have to treat it carefully and treat it with respect and use as little of it as we can and i suppose we'd be hoping very much i suppose that look if we can if we can get farmers you know uh focus more and getting value out of their slurry or or, or dung 
and um, and maybe look maybe next year is the year to, to have a look at clover and to see where that might fit into your system and hopefully you know we might be able to 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 take cost out of the system on a permanent basis then you know with the expectation or the hope obviously that fertilizer prices will will return to whatever normal level is within a year or two that you know we we'll, we'll, we'll still keep these savings in the amount of fertilizer that we're using on on farms and having to buy in and that's both good for for your pocket and the bottom line but also will be good for um for the environment well i've amalgamated a, a couple of questions here because they're on the they're on the same theme and and, and it's about the, the 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 question of the burden the burden of, of, of reducing slaughterage and, and I'd add an addendum. I mean, is there a burden or is it at least cost neutral? Yeah, I, I think what we need to do is find a way of achieving lower slaughter rages that are cost effective, that actually reduce cost and increase profitability. And, and we've seen from some of the systems, both commercially and also in terms of our research systems, that reducing aged slaughter can result in better profitability as, as well as having an environmental benefit. In terms of the burden, I suppose, Frank, or the director mentioned it very well earlier, in terms of the, the menu of options, you know, we'll, we'll have to explore every avenue that's available to us uh, to meet the targets that are out there. Um, I suppose in terms of the, the re reducing age of slaughter um, practice, you're looking at somewhere, you know, less than 10%, uh, probably less than 5% at the, uh, at the higher mitigation requirement. If it's, if it's 7 million tonnes, it's going to be something less than 5%. Uh, if it's uh, per month, if it's at the five megatons, then it's probably going to be uh, closer to the 10%. So, you know, there's, that still means we have 90% to achieve uh, from, other, from other practices. So there, we have to use every, every tool in our armory here uh, to meet these targets. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's the final two questions. And um, again, I'll, I'll amalgamate them. Is, are, are there any efforts at EU level to give extra quota, if you like, for Irish beef production that will be exported to markets where it uh, replaces much higher emissions? This, this whole idea of counter uh, carbon leakage, if you, if you like. And should farmers be incentivized to slaughter cattle at a younger age? That's pseudo political, but um, um, Paul, you might take it up first. Yeah, I suppose the first question in terms of the EU policy, I suppose we're, we're locked into an accounting mechanism, if you like, uh, that's, that's written down at, at, at global level, you know, the IPCC accounting methodology. Uh, so we have to follow that. And that's, that's fairly much written down in stone until 2030. I think after that, uh, there are probably opportunities and hopefully there will be opportunities to address maybe some of the food security elements of that, uh, as well as some of the discussion around how the various gases are accounted for. Uh, but I think in the in the ter in terms of the obligations we currently have uh, that were bound by international rule books uh, in terms of how that is accounted for. Um, I suppose yeah, the second. Paul. Sorry, Paul. Question. Yeah, I, I just I was going to yeah, ask on, you, Paul, Matt, yeah. Matt, in terms of the second question, can you just repeat that again? It, it was the whole idea of of um, farmers being incentivized to slaughter cattle at a younger age. Yeah, I, I mean. Uh, I suppose there's a policy question around that and there's a, I suppose, a marketing question around that. Uh, and I know that the, the, the meat industry, I mean, we're, we're heavily involved in various programs with the meat industry uh, around reducing age at slaughter and around meeting our climate obligations and our general environmental obligations. Uh, and equally at, at policy level, the department are heavily involved in a lot of the research and funding a lot of the research. Uh, Sinead uh, spoke about the Metabate project, which, you know, is really looking at opportunities to, to, to uh, alleviate some of the methane produced during feeding periods. Uh, so we, we have a lot of policy interest in this area. Uh, and in terms of the pricing mechanism, that's another avenue that will have to be explored. I mean, I think Kevin, I add, interrupted you earlier. I know, if you can add a little bit, I mean, I think that at EU level, there is um, there's this concept called a CBAM, which is the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. And this is the idea that we may in Europe uh, start to tax imports into the European Union that are that so as to prevent carbon leakage of the type we talked about earlier. So, um, you know, it hasn't been introduced yet, but it's certainly been discussed uh, at a European level as, a, as something that uh, could happen for things like steel, but also potentially for things like, like beef, um, where reducing produce, production in the European Union, if it's offset by higher intensity production elsewhere, it doesn't do anything for the global uh, level of emissions. Um, I think uh, in terms of the incentivization for younger age, I mean, this is this this reflects the, the kind of conundrum we have with lots of environmental problems in that um, 
we need to signal society's concern with the with climate change. And so we all as, as citizens are continuously tell politicians and pollsters that this is really important and, and climate change is the most important thing going on out there. But then we don't really reflect that in our private behavior in terms of what we consume, whether that's holidays, flying to places far away, eating lovely beef product produced in Ireland, uh, buying a new computer, you know, there's a disconnect between what we say we want and what we actually consume. Now, as consumers increasingly are concerned about things like climate, if that does get reflected in their buying behavior, it won't take very long. If the Tesco's of this world and the Carrefour's of this world are start to tell the ABPs and Dawn Meats that they really want to see their beef produced at a younger slaughter age with a lower carbon footprint, well, then, then you can bet your bottom dollar the meat factories will have an incentive to incentivize farmers to do that. So it will be really driven, I think, by consumer choices. And um, I personally, I don't think we'll see taxpayers' money going in to incentivize farmers to do something that taxpayers through their consumption choices should be doing. Yeah, there, there, there is a question of whether it, it would be in the factory's best interest to reduce um, um, or to encourage and incentivize younger slaughter age. And, we're not getting into that because I'm not awfully sure that uh, that it, it would be in their, their best I'm economic not, interest. I'm, I'm, not sure, in... I'm not sure it is yet either because I'm not sure enough consumers are, are willing to pay for it. But I yeah. mean, when they are, when they start to make those demands, I think there will be movement in that direction from the factory side. Yes, it's, it's, it's that difficulty where uh, consumers want everything, but they're not necessarily willing to pay for it. Uh, uh, Frank, as part of uh, your, 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 your parting remark, um, I, I'll throw in a question. What do we collectively need to do to ensure that these improvements to technical efficiency, early age of slaughter and so on and so forth, get acknowledged into the national inventory? Well, look, that's, that's part of the research that we do, Matt, that, you know, wherever, you know, we, we say something um, is going to improve the emissions thing, we have to make sure then that it can get counted in the inventory. So, look, things like reducing age of slaughter is actually quite easy to get counted in the inventory because just there's less animals there, whatever, you know, when you go to count them. Um, other things are a bit more difficult, uh, you know, but things like protected urea gets counted directly in the inventory. Uh, low emission slurry spreading, that was something that we worked on and provided a methodology for the EPA to, to include that in the inventory. And that was through using the National Farm Survey that Kevin and his team uh, collect. So, so look, it, it's something that we're, we're very conscious of. There's no point doing something to reduce emissions if it doesn't get counted. So um, look, ju just maybe Matt, in terms of, of, of summing up and, and, and where, where do we go from here? And look, I, I'm very positive. Um, Matt, about where we go here, where the beef industry goes from here. As Paul showed, look, we have a very, um, we have a very good starting position with regard to emissions. And, and we're all told that emissions are important and the society is demanding this. And Borbia uh, would say that this is very much reflected in the buyers of Irish beef, that they want that. So I think we, we have to be proud of, of the performance that we have uh, to date, but we do have a monkey on our back with these these targets, and it's not as if anyone is, I suppose, putting this monkey in our back just just to be awkward. Like every sector of the economy, whether it's electricity generation, whether it's transport, whether it's it's the way we heat our houses, there, there there's big changes going to happen over the next ten years. So 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 it's it's not it's not just agriculture. We have to recognise that, but we we do, I suppose, have to try and get this monkey off our back and. I think we can. I think the, the the proposition we have is that by efficiency and technologies, and that's existing technologies and new ones that we'll develop, that there is a way to reach these targets. I think it's very important for us to, to show the rest of our of our country that we're actually on that pathway, that we, we start to make early progress with regard to that. And we try to turn this narrative around that, look, agriculture is a big problem with regard to our emissions. And we start showing that actually agriculture is getting out ahead of transport. It's getting out ahead of energy. It's, it's, it's getting its emissions down. I think we can do that. And I think that's the, the challenge that, that we have. You know, with the, the name of the, the program that we talked about tonight, Future Beef, um, I, you know, that's an important name because I think it is about the future of beef. And I, I think there's a very positive future for our beef industry. And part of that future is going to have to be uh, dealing with the environmental issues that come uh, fr from not just beef, but dairy, every aspect of agriculture. And, and, and look, that, that's just part of the change. You're around Matt and I'm around long enough to have seen a huge amount of change in, in, the, in the agriculture sector and the farming industry over time. 
so it's continually changing and evolving. And this is the direction we're, we're going to evolve in now over the next decade or so into a kind of a low carbon uh, uh, future. And we have the technologies to, to bring us there. You know, in, in the main, they're not going to be expensive technologies. They're actually technologies that, that will help contribute to the bottom line. So, so the job for us in Chagask is to work with farmers and support them in adopting those technologies. And that's what we'll, we'll be doing through Future Beef or through the Dairy Beef 500 campaign that we'll be launching shortly, both of which feed into the Signpost program. And I suppose, look, every sector of agriculture in Ireland, whether it's dairy, beef, sheep, tillage, pigs, I think every sector will, will have to contribute um, into these emissions reductions targets. But it is in all of, of our interests. It is a kind of a collective good thing. Um, but, and, and I suppose to, to get everyone to buy into that is really important. And I think in order to get people to buy into that, they have to see a way out of it at the end. And that's why it's important, I think, that the message goes out that, look, there is a pathway to get out of this. You know, if, 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 we, if we do uh, the research, get the technologies, and, and farmers are, are able to adopt those technologies, that's our route out of it. The transport sector will put a million cars on the road by 2030 or some, some time after it. That's what they'll do. So we've got to have our plan as to what we are going to do. And we think that plan is there and we're up for the challenge of working with farmers in implementing that plan. So before That's I finish, a, a I'd just like, to, yeah, just like to thank the 300 odd or 400 odd people that tuned in uh, to our session tonight. And all of them have gone now at this stage. But, um, you know, it was, it was great to have such a crowd and to have such a, a lively Q&A session. And thanks to yourself for, for moderating it and to all my colleagues who are speaking tonight and, and, and the last night for the way we, 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 we ran this. And if I could reiterate that, and thank you, uh, Professor O'Mara, for your positive and optimistic uh, outlook outlook for the future. My thanks to the, the, the doctors, Paul Crossan and uh, Kevin Harrington, and uh, to everyone involved in the background. I know tonight John Leamy and, and Pierce Kelly were very intimately involved in organising these sessions. Uh, so for me, Matt O'Keefe, it remains just to... Uh, Thank our listeners and all the people who sent in questions, our, our, our viewers over the night, and to wish them perhaps a bit early, but a, a happy Christmas and indeed a, a safe Christmas. Thank you very much and good night.